played Dota 2 for thousands of hours. But you've always wanted something more. A reason to fight. A deeper meaning to your battles. But to know the hidden history of Dota 2, you must go on an adventure of a lifetime. An adventure into the law! Hello and welcome back to Lorgasm! It's that time of year again, another international and another hero that has been released into the world of Dota 2. And you know what that means? When we get a new hero, we get ourselves some new lore! Grimstroke is an extremely interesting character introduced into the Dota 2 world for many different reasons. For one, the meta lore of this hero is pretty interesting. Our last hero batch gave us a gigantic amount of info and world building, most likely to beef up the new lore of Artifact and presenting us with a bunch of new people, places, and things for that world to discuss. But Grimstroke is different. He has almost no mentions of the new lore being made in Artifact and very little revelations about the Dota 2 world or characters. Surprisingly enough, he seems to be a self-contained addition to the Dota 2 world. Very interesting indeed when you consider the last two heroes, Willow and Pango, wouldn't shut up about expanding the lore and the universe. Now, there may be many reasons for this. Perhaps he was planned long ago before Artifact's world was being built. But I like to think that it's because it adds an air of mystery to the hero. After all, Pango and Willow both had rather talkative and cheery personalities, whereas Grimstroke, well, uh, he lives up to the name. With that out of the way, let's dig into the presented lore of Grimstroke and look a little deeper into his new painted world. Grimstroke hails from a place called Ashkabor, a new region in the Dota 2 world which was known for a powerful ritual its citizens would participate in. The ritual of the Ascended One. Now the complete story is not really presented, so half headcanon alert here, but it appears young Ascavorians, I think that's how I would say it, who showed promise of being selfless warriors would be taken from their normal lives and taught the path of the Ascended One, the guardian of the Ascavorian people. The guardian would be their strongest, most powerful citizen, his duty to protect the people of Ashkavor and be their unyielding champion. A familiar story, but this one is a little different. The Ascended One of Ashkabor isn't just the people's protector, he is the people themselves. In a painting ritual where the Ascended One would paint a rune on a special runestone, the Guardian would bind his soul to every citizen of Ashkabor using a fraction of each and every one of their strength and adding it into his own. Perhaps even drawing more from his people in desperate battles as needed. That's pretty neat. This power could be dangerous, however, as you could literally have the well-being of your people in your hands as the Guardian, which explains the forced teaching and highly selective processes. For a while the Ascended One held incredible power to protect his people, he had direct control over their souls as well. It was a delicate, beautiful balance. Until Grimstroke. With Grimstroke, something went horribly wrong. Now, there's a chance that something corrupted him as he was growing up, his obsessions growing in power to better his people, sending him down a dark and polluted path. But I don't think so. As his lore states, all of his life he'd calculated on how to attain ever greater power than the limits presented by his teachers would allow. To me, this reads that Grimstroke was just a psychopath, a narcissistic, power-hungry painter that from childhood yearned to grow in power and skill at any cost. How he was chosen to be the Ascended One is a mystery. Perhaps he pretended to be the ideal guardian on the outside, but held his deeper desires within, subtly sabotaging other candidates on his vindictive path. Or perhaps he was simply the most powerful. And the years before character traits were considered before power, this time the Ascavorian people ignored the flawed personality for the brute strength the candidate possessed. I personally believe it's the latter, as the lore text states that some Ascavorians had stayed in their homes during the ritual. A strange thing to do when your soul would be bound to that ascended one anyway. 
to me, and uh, we're still on a half headcanon alert here, the fact that some stayed in their homes during the most important ritual of their people means that the decision to make Grimstroke the Ascended One might have been a controversial one. Perhaps the growing threat of the War of the Ancients, bringing with it heroes of incredible, never-before-seen power terrified the people of Ashkabor, and their typically extensive selection process of finding a guardian who had virtues had changed to just be the most powerful candidate among them to protect them against these new powerful foes. After all, what could really go wrong? Well, everything. Grimstroke's lust for personal power took him to dark places, and he managed to get his hands on some Ichor. While we're gonna get into Ichor later, for now, let's just say that it's a dark, evil substance, the blood that pours through the veins of the gods. Uh, not the good kind of gods. At any rate, Grimstroke did the unthinkable, adding in this extremely powerful yet vile substance into the sacred ink, which he would use for all of his magic amplifying his power immensely, but coming at an immeasurable cost when he used it for the binding ritual on the Ascension Day. The Ichor began to overtake him, perhaps trying to take his body and his power for its own. While it flowed into his body, he pushed back with all the force of his people, drawing everything from them. The weak, the children, the sick, the elderly, collapsed as he drew nearly all of what little strength their souls had for his own. But it wasn't enough. The Ichor was going to take him. But then he realized the bond between his people went both ways. They could give him their strength, but they could also take something from him. And now he would force them to. The ink and Ichor flowed out of him and instead flowed to his people, their screams and moans filling the air as every single Askaborian took Grimstroke's punishment for him, being drowned by the ink and becoming shades of their former selves. Spirits of evil, no longer people, but simply ghosts made of ink, loyal to the Ichor that created them. Grimstroke had survived, and he fled the scene to leave Ashkabor a haunted, terrifying land of remnants and ghosts. It would be years later until his return. We learn from his in-game monologue that he needed time to grow in power, to control the Ichor still within him, and to make him its master. When he came back to Ashkavor, he was met with the wailing spirits of his friends and people as they tried again to punish him by driving him away. But he returned to control them, and so he did. He took them as his, enslaved them, and enthralled him to his power, and there, in every stroke of his brush, the screams and pains of the people he promised to protect now haunt his enemies, much to Grimstroke's joy. A dark tale indeed, but a fascinating one. Now there's a lot in here that the lore text doesn't explicitly cover, which we will be going over later, but for now I feel like we should take a break from the deepest of lore and do some meta house cleaning. First things first, where is Ashkabor, and what is the deal with its people? From the trailer, we see a glimpse of Ashkabor, and clearly it is Japanese-inspired. The geography, the Shinto architecture, and the shrines. Shinto shrines were originally brought to Japan by practicing Buddhists around 500 BC, and they are erected in places where it is thought that kami, or spirits, could potentially be attracted. Shinto architecture ranges from the classic stone stairs to fountains of cleansing, to most easily identifiable, the Sando. These great recognizable archways indicating you're on the path to a Shindo shrine. Now we can see many of these here in Ashkabor, which makes a lot of sense since they deal a lot in souls and all that. Little cool note here, did you notice the Radiant Tower at the top of the highest mountain? That's pretty sick. Grimstroke's physical appearance takes a ton of inspiration from the Japanese history, most notably the Japanese Oni. Traditionally, Oni are supernatural ogres or trolls, but are more often than not presented as evil demonic spirits, which are the stars of many Japanese horror stories. Their distinguishing characteristics are the red face, the long teeth, and the horns, and the spiritual ghostly way they flow, much like Grimstroke. You can see his outfit looks like traditional Japanese robes, which are common in ghost stories, as many paranormal things tend to happen late in the night when everyone's wearing their home sleepy time robes. Even more interesting than all that, the only weapon of choice is the Kanabo, which is a studded war club. If you look closely enough at Grimstroke's brush, it is actually a modified Kanabo with a brush head instead of a top. Now that is super sick. 
So, without a doubt, Grimstroke takes his influence from Japanese demons, and Ashkabor appears to be a very similar feudal Japan. But here is where we run into our first big question. We already have a Japanese hero, the Juggernaut. Juggernaut is clearly Japanese-inspired as well, from his voice, his appearance, and his mannerisms, this guy is 100% Japanese-inspired. But this creates a problem, because Juggernaut not only looks nothing like Grimstroke, but we also know for a fact his homeland, the Isle of Masks, is gone, and all of his people with it. How could both characters come from what we assume to be the Dota 2 equivalent of Japan if we know one is a ghost town and the other is straight up gone? All right, now first things first, Juggernaut and Grimstroke are not of the same species. Easy way to see this is fingers. Juggernaut is very human-like with five fingers and Grimstroke only has four, a trait that's shared among most of the troll characters in the game. Shadow Shaman, he's part hill troll, he has four. Troll Warlord, of course, has four. Huskar's rocking the four and Dazzle only has three, which uh, I'm pretty sure Dazzle's a hill troll, but it's Dazzle, so who knows. Whoa, 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 I know what you're saying. Go back, go back. Huskar looks nearly identical to Grimstroke. Look at that color, the ears. They're basically the same, right? Eh, maybe. But personally, I feel like the blue skin color is more of a side effect of dying and coming back. For what we know about Grimm's lore, he was probably dead for a while there, or at least went to the other side and fought against an essence from the afterlife. Huskar was dead for some time as well, so I think the blue skin is more of a side effect of messing with death and spirits rather than the natural color. But who knows. What's important here though is that Jug and Grimm clearly are not the same species. Also, side note, how is Jug's skin color yellow and he speaks stereotypical Japanese and nobody's ever complained about this? That character is the most racist looking character I've ever seen. Eh, fantasy worlds. Anyway, so Grimm and Jug are not from the same people. But are they from the same place? Perhaps the fateful binding ritual that destroyed Ascavor was the same event that killed Jug's people and made the Isle of Mask disappear. Are they both one and the same? Nah, I don't think so. The disappearance of the Isle of Masks is known world over, referenced by many heroes and is common knowledge that the island is just gone. Whereas we know that Ashkabor is still around, and Grimm was able to return to it years later. It's just a terrified haunted ghost town. So, no, they weren't the same place, and I also doubt it was the same event, as no one seems to know what happened to the Isle of Masks, but Grimm's homeland seems pretty cut and dry about its fate. So how do we explain this? Well, it's pretty easy, as long as we assume that both are islands, much like the real Japan. Perhaps the part of the world that Ashkabor and the Isle of Masks exists in is much like the real world Japan, a collection of volcanic islands connected by one large mass. Now, I always assumed that the Isle of Mask was Japan in the Dota world, taking up the entire country, but maybe in Dota 2, it split up a bit. Perhaps Shikoku is the Isle of Masks and Hokadio is Ashkabor, and there are even more islands with its own people separated geographically. If Grimstroke really is a troll, as his Omni inspiration and finger count suggests, it would make sense, with the hilly picture we saw in his trailer, that he would be in a different part of Dota 2's Japan-like nation than Juggernaut. What's really, really weird, though, is that these two characters have nearly zero interaction. Grimstroke says the most generic line ever when he kills Juggernaut, I send you to meet your kin and bafflingly has no lines for meeting Jug on the battlefield as a friend or enemy. In fact, I might be wrong, but I think Grimm has lines for literally every other hero but Jug, which is very strange indeed. Perhaps the lines were recorded but removed due to lore inconsistencies, or perhaps they reveal something coming and they didn't want to spoil it. Either way, I'm pretty confident these two come from lands that are very similar, if not right next to each other. Potentially, they should be very close, but we get none of that. Of course, it's a fantasy world, so for all I know, it's nothing like Japan, but considering that the Isle of Mask was an island, and the destruction of Ascavor took all of its people, I would have to assume that the entire population of a place disappearing would be rather well known unless it was on an island, as islands have less people due to them being smaller space than the mainland. So yeah, it sounds to me like they're both islands, they're both heavily Japanese inspired, so it makes sense that both are near each other but they were both destroyed by different events. All right, we're done. Or are we? Because now we gotta talk about the spirits. Check out this part of the trailer. My teachers, 
my teachers. And there we clearly have Ember Spirit. All right, let's get into this mess. Ember Spirit, now we know what this is a reference to. Grimstroke was taught from childhood on how to become the Ascended One, the guardian of the people. This is implying that one of his teachers was, in fact, the Ember Spirit, or more accurately, the man that Ember Spirit decided to take over. Uh, let's refresh ourselves with a little bit of Ember Spirit lore. Lost within the Wailing Mountains, the fortress of Flares lay abandoned. Its draining halls empty, its courtyard covered in leaves and dust. Huh, the Wailing Mountains. All the spirits lore shares this general area, the Wailing Mountains, but we've never seen it before. Could this be the Wailing Mountains that we saw in the trailer? Nah, I don't think so, but it is something to think about. Upon a daze, in its sealed temple rests a topaz cauldron, filled with ancient ash, remnants of a pyre, for the warrior poet Jin. Warrior poet. Basically, this is saying that Zin is the Sun Tzu of Dota 2. Oh, that right. For three generations, Jin taught his acolyte the bonds of the Guardian Flame, a series of mantras to train the mind and body for the harsh realities beyond the fortress walls. However, in a teaching a warrior's way, he earned a warrior's rival. And in his autumn, Jin was bested and slain. Now this is interesting. Zin died to a rival. Does this mean that Grimstroke was the rival? Eh, probably not. It would be a much bigger story if Zin was killed by his student. But hey, eh, it could be your personal headcanon if you want. His followers spread to the wind. Yet as years turned to centuries, and followers to descendants, his teachings endured by subtle whisper and deed. Okay, now this makes sense. Perhaps the video was showing us that Grimm's teacher was a student of Zinn, and thus kinda him, but not really. Would make sense as to why the link goes to Ember and then to the teacher. Anyway. Touched by the teacher's lasting legacy, the burning celestial, inquisitive aspect of fire cast himself to the fortress of flares and reignited the pyre ash. From the glowing embers emerged an image of Jin, wreathed in flame, his thoughtful countenance prepared to train and to teach, and to spread the fires of knowledge to all who seek guidance. Okay, neat. So the Ember Spirit is Chinese, through and through. He's a direct ripoff of Sun Tzu, writer of the Art of War. His teachings spread throughout the world, which actually isn't too crazy that they'd be in Ashkabor. Buddhism spread from China to Japan and with the Sinto architecture. So makes a lot of sense actually that the Chinese warrior's teaching of Zen was also found in Japan. You know, uh, fantasy China and fantasy Japan in Dota 2. So the teacher dies. Was the teacher actually Zin or one of his pupils? Well, I know what story I prefer, that the original Zin moved from the Wailing Mountains to Dota 2's Japan, and in his autumn years he wanted to teach a new breed of students, become the teacher in ways of peaceful warfare and guardians of Ashkabor, but he was slain by Grimstroke post-ritual. His body moved back home by his devout followers to burn it and rid it of the evil inside. Ah, uh, but that's probably not what happened. What probably happened is that one of Zin's students, who studied the art of peace and war, was one of the masters of Ashkabor, and he was slain. Just a random dude. But we pass over the biggest question. Who the fuck is this guy? Now I know that everyone has been saying this is Storm Spirit. This is not Storm Spirit. Look at this dude. Storm Spirit has a little bit of facial hair, but this guy has a massive mustache and a huge ass beard, not to mention that flowing ponytail. Now some people have been saying that the mustache and the ponytail are actually Storm's hat, that nah, nah, doesn't make any sense. That hat would have to start on his massive beard. Now everybody, everybody dies in this trailer, but this one dude. They're all hit with the ink, but not him, and they make a point to show this. And Grimstroke talks about his teachers here, plural. Now, if we are right to assume the lame version, that the teacher here is just a student of Ember, and that's why Ember is in the picture, then that's only one teacher in this picture. 
which means that our mystery dude back here is another style or school of teacher. He is painted just like Ember Spirit, more of a background character than the highly detailed foreground character, meaning that he may not be a physical person that taught Grimstroke, but rather a style of teaching, and that his teachers used that style. All right, time for the big head cannon alert. Where Ember Spirit taught the ways of protection, duty, and intelligence, the other teacher must have taught the other things a guardian needed. Power, strength, and magic. This was the path that Grimstroke was most interested in. But who was that second teacher? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna say something that you've been waiting for me to say for a few years now. I think this is the fourth fucking spirit! I do not say this lightly. The entire Dota 2 lore community has been looking for any signs of the fourth spirit since the Monkey King comic was released, where it showed a picture of the fourth unknown purple spirit. Now, every single year, every single update, the community has been looking for a way that the next hero is the fourth spirit. People were even thinking that it was going to be a water spirit because of TI-7 because it was water themed for no reason. Ah! The fourth spirit is purple. Let's go back all the way to the first episode of Lorgasm and talk about colors. Colors mean something in Dota 2, and purple means mystery, the unknown, the space between worlds, the higher enigmas. Enigma, for example, is purple, Darkseer, Void, Templar, concepts like the unknown, the interdimensional, time, secrets respectively, all confusing and mysterious ideas. And now we have the fourth spirit, the purple spirit, the spirit of... We don't know, but this picture could be his first real appearance. Why? Because of Bane. The Ikor, the ink blacky essence that turned the ritual of the Guardian upside down. We don't know much about the Ikor, but we have heard the term before. The Ikor of Niktasha is Bane. By the Ikor of Niktasha, the Ikor of Niktasha shall drag you into my domain. This inky black substance flows from Bane and is quite possibly the dark manifestation of the blood of the gods, the black ooze that forms a nightmarish form of a god's worst thoughts. The Ikor itself gave Bane his form. He literally is made of the stuff. And it was most likely trying to do the same to Grimstroke during its use in the binding ritual. Given this dark Ikor, this inky blood has only been referenced by Bane before Grimstroke's release, he has some words for Bane when you meet him in the game. From the source of such power, I expected more. I should take your corpse with me. Shame to let such potent ingredients go to waste. From the source of such power. It's undeniable. The Ikor that Grimstroke used was from Bane. But did he get it from Bane? Tell me, Bane, have you ever been to Ashkavor? Maybe not. He isn't aware of Bane ever visiting Ashkavor himself, which means that Grimstroke didn't get the Ikor directly from the source. But who did? Who could have had the power to directly come in contact with Bane? Who would have been able to travel to the purple unknown? Who would have taught the opposite of the teachings of Zinn? Who else than the purple motherfucking spirit could have given that Ikor to his students? He's the goddamn fourth spirit, people. The fourth spirit himself right here in the trailer. The one who poured the Ikor. The one that set in motion the events of Grimstroke's lore right here, finally. Or not. You know, it's just a theory. A very strong theory, though. Whew, okay. So we've covered the physical and geographical lore of Grimstroke, his motivations, his blood of Bane, and the gods that gave him immense power at the cost of his people. Potentially the first real evidence of the fourth freaking spirit. But we have a lot more to cover. Let's talk about the character in the present, and what is Grimstroke's future? Now, hearing the story of Grimstroke, you might think that he is filled with remorse. His attempt to seek power, protecting his people, backfiring and filling him with regret and sorrow. But surprisingly, and fascinatingly, it's pretty much the opposite. Grimstroke couldn't care less about sacrificing his people to grow his own power. In fact, he seems rather happy that it happened, which is a really cool character in my opinion. He has always lusted for power, and to him, the means here justified the end. It doesn't matter if all of his friends, family, and loved ones were sacrificed for him to be more powerful, because he feels like he was always better than them anyway. <laughs> what an asshole. I love it. 
Grimstroke is an arrogant, self-centered narcissist artist that thinks that his paintings and power make him better than everyone else in the world. And if you've ever been to art school before, I guarantee some of you met a Grimstroke in real life. Ah, it's great. Now, the most interesting part about his personality is his love. Grimstroke's W is Phantom's Embrace. He summons one particular spirit to attack his enemies, the woman that he loved. You could even see her turning into a shade in the trailer. Now the flavor text here is pretty fascinating. Grimstroke holds no sorrow for the downfall of his people, only for Yavoi, uh, Yaohi? For Yaovi, she who was most dear to him, does he feel even a semblance of longing. No, not regret, not sorrow, but longing. We learn more about this relationship through some of his voice lines. Thoughts of lost loves only entrap us in the past, Skyrath. Dwell not on what might have been. Interesting that he tells others not to dwell on love that could have held them back. But only in one line do we get even a hint of loss from Grimstroke. Was my rise foreseen, Oracle? What would have become of her? Of us? Had I taken another path? This is fascinating. Only once does Grimstroke ever question what could have been if he had followed in the footsteps of the Ascended before him, in another world where him and his love were able to be together in a life of duty, honor, and protection. The Oracle sees all the different paths and must be able to see a world in which Grimstroke was a protector. And Grimstroke, for a brief moment, wonders what could have been. But it fades as he is who he is, an egotistical asshole. I love it. Love leads only to suffering, Zeus. So that's Grimstroke now, content with using the horrific suffering of those that trusted and loved him for his own personal art and power. But why is he in the War of the Ancients? Let's check out a few of his rare responses. I'm not the last of my people. Those who ascended before me still remain. The ascended ones shrink from me. They still hope our people can be saved. The power of the ascended ones was warped by my transformation. They live barely. Very interesting. So past ascended ones, the few that were chosen before Grimstroke to be the guardians of Ashkabor are still alive in some form. Perhaps they are literally still alive because the bond between the people and the Guardians is broken when a new Guardian is chosen, making the retired Ascended Ones the only Ashkavorians who don't have a link to everyone else. Or, you know, they exist in some kind of Ascended One spiritual plane, all the ancestors watching over the current Ascended One, much like in Japanese and Chinese cultures about lineage and history and your ancestors always watching. Uh, we don't know which one is true, but let's continue. With the power of the ancients in hand, the last remnants of my kind will learn. There's nowhere left to hide. The hollow spaces I feel inside will at last be made whole. And there it is. Grimstroke is fighting to get the power of the Ancients to track down and take the last of his people into the binding ritual and reach his maximum potential. Now, what's interesting here is the last line, the hollow pieces I feel inside. Is he simply talking about the missing members of the people, or is he talking about something else? Perhaps by finally capturing the last of his people, he can put the past fully behind him, with no one to judge his actions and no one working to undo his terrible curse. Maybe it's even more than that. With the last survivors gone, he doesn't need to think about them as people anymore, but just tools. Maybe there is still someone deep in there, deep down, thinking about life with his love and remembering all those he sacrificed. And if he can just get rid of those last survivors, he can finally kill that person inside. But I don't think so. I still think Grimstroke is just a piece of shit, and I love him for it. All right, so let's do some wrap up for everything else that's interesting that we haven't covered yet. First, rivalries. Grimstroke's voice lines are all very egotistical, egocentric. He doesn't think highly of really anybody else and holds himself above all others. But there are a few heroes that he really, really dislikes, and most of them are the spirits. Stay away from me, Kowlin. 
I find your presence offensive, Zin. Don't make me lose what a little respect I had for you, Raijin. Your very existence was offensive. Your flame isn't even your own, Zin. What hope did you have against me? Now, there have been some talks about the spirits being involved with an event in Ashkavor's past floating around. I never found any evidence of that. As far as I can tell, there's two possible reasons why Grimstroke hates the spirits so much. The first is pretty obvious, that he was taught by one of them, or at least a student of one of them. If the teachings of Ember are the same teachings he rebelled against, then he must have had a very little respect for the spirits as a whole, as they all seem to share the same feelings towards one another and the same philosophies. More likely, however, I think he hates what they represent. Letting a power consume you, becoming one with a power rather than commanding it yourself. Check out these lines. So you let this spirit wear you like a hat, Thundercake? Look what happens to a puppet when you cut the strings. Time to get you out of that skin suit, spirit. Now in all the spirit stories, the lore is very similar. There's a well-known person who is doing good. They combine with a spirit of the elements to give them a spiritual form and increase their power exponentially. For Ember and Earth, the vessels were dead, but reborn and merged with that spirit. For Storm Spirit, the spirit was forced to merge with Thunder Keg, but the result was still the same. Spirit and man becoming one. Perhaps it's that unity that Grimstroke hates, as the only other hero that he really dislikes is Undying. The dirge sickens me. I can see you think you're part of something greater, Undying. But I am something greater. Now, Undying, much like the spirits, has completely fused with the Dirge, becoming its vessel and existing as one. Grimstroke's fate would have been exactly the same as these four characters had he not sacrificed his people instead, becoming one with the Ikor and basically becoming the spirit version of Bane. But instead, he found a way to command the great power that tried to take him, and perhaps he looks down on those who he thinks were too weak to control the power as its master rather than its puppet. Other interactions are a little less interesting. He finds demons and other corrupted heroes respectable because they're similar to him. You understand, Lion. Nothing gained with nothing given. For some reason, he finds Night Stalker to be beautiful, which is uh, weird. I take little pleasure in killing such a beautiful creature. But interestingly, he seems to be recruiting heroes to fight with him. Although, disturbingly, he only seems to want to recruit women. The fools here don't appreciate your talents, maiden. You could be so much more. They laugh at you, Riley. Yet you continue to smile. Make them fear you. When we're finished here, princess, I could help you take what's rightfully yours. Perhaps looking for a replacement of his lost love? I sure hope not, but he sure is going hard for Crystal Maiden. Other random things to take note, apparently he has some kind of deep knowledge about demons, like Maraxiform, the one who transformed Clinks. I take no pleasure in destroying Maraxiform's greatest work of art. And most surprisingly of all, he gives us a little bit more lore about the mysterious Agnum, questioning if he is alive or not. Is it true about Aghanim's demise? I've heard conflicting reports. Now there's a few more lore tidbits in here, but they're rather inconsequential, like him knowing some secrets that Templar knows, his respect for Wraith King, who also sacrificed his people for ascension, his knowing that Spirit Breaker serves a strange master. Also, little note here, Spectre also talks about ascending and the trans-ascended ones, but I don't really think that it fits in anywhere. Hey, if you can make somehow a connection, be my guest. But overall, that's about it for Grimstroke. What an interesting character, and what a fun addition to the lore of Dota 2. I still don't really understand why he doesn't reference anything from Artifact while the last two heroes wouldn't shut up about it, but perhaps this lore and character was made long ago, and the plans for Dota 2's universe was set in stone for some time. Because we still have one mystery, the greatest mystery of all. The mystery of the unknown spirit left to solve in the original Dota 2 lore universe. And with Grimstroke, I really think we got a little closer. Besides that, it sure is great to have a truly evil addition to the lore. Thank you everybody for watching Lorgasm. It sure is great to be back. Sorry for that long separation while I was working on the international, but the TI is done and I have returned.
big shout out to our Patreons that survived the months of no content. Uh, from now on at the end of these videos, I'm gonna go ahead and shout these guys out that have been sticking around. Of course, if you wanna see good content like this, again, I use my Patreon only to pay the artists and the local community guys in Dota 2. So throw some your way and you'll see some more Lorgasm soon. Anyway, shout out to Sheep Eater 1701, The Dupe, Sean Baker, 20, Bistiachi, Random Guy, Lucy, Kelsey Biggums, Mr. Magnificent, and Yoss. Thank you guys so much for staying with me. It has been an absolute pleasure and I hope to get some more good content coming your way now that I'm a free man. Thanks for watching Lorgasm guys. We'll see you next time for some more lore. I'm an old man.